So anyway, it's always, uh, I will say it's very nice to uh, welcome back uh, an alumna of, the, of our university. And uh, Emma Hilton Grange was an MR student here and also a part three student. I think Scott was your tutor. Right? Yeah. Says hello. Um, so Emma Hilton Grange is an associate architect at Brydenwood uh, who's worked at the practice since uh, 2019. Uh, Emma has been involved in several projects, the practice including developing a modular housing scheme for LNG modu modular homes, expanding a, a knowledge of DFMA and off-site construction work in projects such as a kit of parts uh, system for a bespoke housing company, Kiss House, as well as a number of uh, healthcare projects. Um, and I should say, Bryden Wood uh, is a global company of creative technologists, um, designers, architects, engineers, and analysts, and so it's an interesting uh, mix, unusual in a way for an architectural firm, um, and they're very interested in shaping the future of construction by bringing integrated expertise, I'm sorry I'm reading this, uh, innov innovation, deep experience, open minds and creativity to unravel the most complex problems and create exceptional sustainable uh, design solutions. Uh, so this interest in efficiency, one, um, and also this acknowledgement that there's a sort of separation somehow between design and the actual construction or the kind of uh, the making of architecture. And I think that's what Bryden would really uh, have championed. Um, so tonight, Emma's going to be joined by her colleagues. Um, Helen Huff, Head of Sustainability. Um, Nicola Moriarty, who's a structural engineer, the Head of Structures there. Um, and this, I think they're very interested in this kind of, uh, this multidisciplinary kind of practice. And I think this is a great example. And I think this is a brilliant, it's a brilliant coup for Bryden Wood because this is, this is how you understand the Elizabeth line if you've been on it. And if any of you, if you haven't, I would go and have a look. And actually all the stations kind of, they kind of look like this. And never mind all the other architects involved, who cares about them? This is actually, <laughs> It's kind of bright wood, so, it's, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. Look at their website. There's some really nice interviews with some of the partners there talking about their approach to, to architecture or, or kind of new approach to architecture and construction. It's, it's super interesting. And this idea of, of DFMA, which you will find out about this evening. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Do we use that one or do we use this one? Should we use this one? Perfect. Thank you, Will, for the introduction. Okay, so Will's explained a bit about us. So who are Brydenwood? Brydenwood are a global company of creative technologists, designers, architects, engineers, and analysts. We're a global company of creative te um, technologists. Um, sorry, I've missed a slide. Here we go. Um, we're shaping the future of construction by bringing integrated expertise, innovation and creativity to unravel the most complex problems and create exceptional sustainable design solutions. We aim to challenge the client, we make them think about what they really require from the building and really challenge the brief, designing for assets that bring the most value in the most innovative and creative ways. We're leaders in the theory and practice of modern methods of construction, um, platform approach to design for manufacturing assembly, generative design, creative technologies, integrated design, and automation in construction, all of which support our driving purpose, design to value. Now, I know there's a lot of words in there that probably don't mean a lot, um, but we'll try and bring some clarity to them as we go through the presentation. So why do you think, why, why you might ask, why are we trying to change the industry? Does it really need it? Surely we've been building for hundreds of years with no problems. So what is the problem with construction? And why do we need to transform it? So here are a few of the key factors which I'll expand on over the next few slides, which identify why Brydenwood feels we need to lead the change in the construction industry. The graph shown here explains how productivity in every other sector shown, manufacturing, utilities, agriculture, transport, has continued to increase. But in construction, it's flatlining and in places even decreasing. This is highly inefficient and costs the industry billions every year. On top of this lack of productivity, 
projects in construction often well exceed their program and cost far more than planned, which I'm sure many of you who have worked in architecture practices know. 98% of mega projects incur cost overruns and delays. Average cost increases 80% of the original value, and the average slippage in program is 20 months behind the original um, schedule. We're also hugely wasteful, with 51.3% with of waste costs in construction projects being in the end product. product. Oh, missed one there. Sustainability is another major reason the industry needs to change. 39% of the world's carbon emissions come from construction, and 11% of that is embodied carbon from materials and construction processes. One third of the world's landfill comes from construction. And then on top of this, the UK has an ageing population. There are over 11 million people at the moment in the UK aged 65. And in 10 years' time, this will have increased to 30 million people, 22% of the population. In 2016, over 34% of construction industry employees were over 15 years old. And this, combined with a lack of skilled operatives, is a major issue for the construction industry. Then on top of all of this is the huge demand in the industry. 2.5 billion more people will live in cities by 2050. We're aware in the UK that there's a significant housing crisis, with local authorities often failing to hit their targets of what they need to provide. And there's no wonder when there's so many projects running over budget and over pro programme. So at Bride and Wood, we believe DFMA is a big part of the solution. But what is it? DFMA stands for Design for Manufacture and Assembly. DFMA is an approach to design that prioritises the ability to manufacture the parts of an end product and assemble them in the most efficient ways. This reduces time and subsequently lowers cost. So while there are certain things we can't replicate fully from the manufacturing industry, the most successful parts we can, uh, we can replicate is eliminating waste. Waste processes... Waste material, wasted time, making us far more efficient. A great and familiar example of this is IKEA. Now, you're probably all going, why the hell should you put a Billy bookcase up on the screen? Whether you're building a bed, a wardrobe, a bookshelf, or a chest of drawers, the kit of parts includes components that are all common to lots of different pieces of furniture. Knockdown fittings, soft close hinges, draw bases, sides, dimensional grids, etc. They're all the same when you go to IKEA. The assembly process is also common. The format of the instruction book is always the same. You only ever need an Allen key, a screwdriver, and maybe a hammer. And because man IKEA manufactures such large numbers of components, they benefit from economies of scale to provide increasingly high-quality components. For instance, soft close hinges, once upon a time, you would only get on very high-end cabinetry. But now you get them on all IKEA products. But there are other useful things we can learn. For example, when you go to IKEA, you wouldn't build your furniture in their store, strap it to the top of your car and drive it home, the equivalent to a volumetric modular. You buy compact kits of parts so that you can transport multiple pieces of furniture in a single trip. When you bring the kits of parts home, you don't assemble them in the drive and then take it through your house in a big piece. You assemble it as close to the end point as you can. You effectively turn your bedroom into a manufacturing facility for the furniture. This is the principle behind what manufacturing does. It brings the parts as close to the making process as possible. It has all the parts to hand, and it knows that it can create what well, it creates speed, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. We intuitively know that this is the best way to do it when you buy an IKEA piece, and therefore we can learn from that in, manuf in, in construction. So by using a DFMA approach in construction projects, we can reduce programme on site, enhance quality and sustainability, increase safety and lower costs. In the same way IKEA benefits from economies of scale, so can construction, lowering costs whilst also enhancing quality. As well as this, if we standardise reusing parts across, created off-site across projects, buildings or even parts of a building, we can increase the speed in which things are built due to repetitive processes being used. So when we're talking about DFMA, and you might think, 
standardisation off-site, modular volumetric, industrialised construction, all slightly different and creating a confusing landscape to get your head around. If we see modern methods of construction as the overarching approach, when DFMA, then DFMA is the process to maximise value, which can be categorised into three elements. Off-site, so you're moving labour to a safer, more productive environment. This might be volumetric modular, flats, bathroom pods, plant skids, pre-packaged MEP, panelised solutions and kits of parts. You've then got platforms, which are cross-sector standardised components, which we'll speak about more later in one of our case studies. There you can harness the economy of scales. And digital. MMC is as much about the way we, we design and the processes. Big data, analytics, algorithms and configurators. Automating design. So there we're saying MMC is much about the process. How can we make it easier with less wasted time? Does every design have to be bespoke? Surely building typologies hold elements in common that can be reused. For us, industrialised construction and use of automa automation in design are inherently linked, and there's little point in developing a generative design workflow if we then deliver a project traditionally. Similarly, we couldn't develop a highly compon componentized system and then deliver it using 2D drawings and documents. Our way of working at Bryden Wood brings those elements together into one streamlined delivery process, which we can then deliver the greatest value for our clients. This diagram shows where various clients and projects sit in terms of our delivery module, in terms of degree of sophistication of manufacture, um, led principles and industrialization, and the design tools used. And you can see there's a general trend towards the top right, seen as the two aspects are inter interdependent. So at Bryden Wood, we start with stakeholder engagement and, and really understanding a client's needs from a, a, a range of perspectives. We work by a design-to-value approach to our projects. Adopting a design-to-value approach means understanding the most efficient route and the most efficient solution is to make, first make sure you analyse and understand the commercial opportunity from every, every angle. So here we've got some angles that you can analyse a design through. So metrics such as capital cost and return on investments, for example, won't define how well an asset functions in the real world. There's much more to it than that. Design that is fully rooted in design-to-value methodology should also consider things like expected lifetime of components and materials, as well as aspects such as location, climate change, and the well-being of the workforce. This will be different for every project and needs to be defined to establish the design and construction process we use. As you know, the capital cost of a building of an, of an asset is only a small fraction of the whole life cost, and potentially the impact on business or society is much larger still. At the earliest stage, we work to our, with our clients to explore the widest range of possible variables and impacts, the functional process, the need for staffing, the likely impact on the business as a whole, and the existing di design assets that have been most beneficial. By understanding this wide consideration set, we reconcile the greatest number of business and operational needs within the design, designing assets from the inside out. So by doing this, we're essentially gathering data. By continually working to optimise the function, the architectural form and the asset of the asset, it eventually becomes clear, as does the construction methodology. The value of Bride and Wood's DFMA backbone is the ability to review the buildability and delivery strategy of any project on its individual merits. In the earliest stages of design, and come up with the right strategy and blend to deliver the most value. So, for example, that might be for some clients a configurator, an app to configure their buildings. It might be for other other clients, a much more traditional process. It's bespoke for every client. So how big are the benefits of DFMA and our design-to-value approach? 
here are some Bryden Wood um, projects that show you our, some of the biggest benefits. So firstly, safety. Um, a number of the safety benefits are summarised above. And just to, just to summarise these, some of them are number of operatives and vehicle movements reduced, number of tasks reduced, um, working at height reduced, there's no un unplanned ad hoc temporary works or movements, repetitive tasks are planned and optimised, um, on-site activities are highly planned and coordinated. Risk assessments are reduced. Um, we, have a better, we have a better idea of what components will fit the right way around, less margin for er error. Um, there's a higher percentage of operative time spent in training. We can do that via VR, AR in mock-ups. Um, and then they're working in safer environments ahead of working on a live site. We've also got digital feedback loops. Um, which allows more comprehensive automated reporting on the process. So checking things are working. And this shows that some of our projects, GSK, Heathrow Connection and Lansex Summer Street, just some of the reduction in site operatives, reducing working at height just by automating some of the design and the, the processes. Speed is another massive benefit. The projects above show a significant reduction in programme which is achieved by highly productive operatives on site, highly coordinated design and logistics, use of prefabrication and off-site thinking, lower cost of welfare facilities, less stress on surrounding public transport and infrastructure, and quicker operation of the assets leading to better business outcomes. So you can see here we've got um, some of our... our recent projects like the Circle Hospitals where we delivered them with a 20% programme reduction, um, Heathrow Cargo Tunnel where it was a one year pro programme reduction. And cost reduction is obviously very important to clients. This shows um, the order of savings of some projects in different sectors. The savings are not a few percent, they're very significant numbers and they result from a number of factors. Smaller footprints of a facility through the process of rationalisation and getting to know that brief and that value. Reduced building volume by integrating mechanical and electrical services and plant. Further reduction in air handling, plant cooling load, lighting and electrical load associated with the previous two points that I've made. And simplified construction methodologies and application of DFMA principles, leading to reduced schedule, better controlled logistics, fewer operatives on site, higher productivity, less work, less waste and rework. So skills and training is an, another, another big benefit of DFMA. Here we've got examples where we've engaged a workforce that have no construction experience. So one of the global challenges facing construction, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the lack of skilled operatives and that we have an ageing population and, and demographic in, in construction. So these projects engaged non-construction workers and by doing this we're able to tackle this issue, diversify the labour pool by creating new jobs and skills. The impact of this, if done at scale, is potentially vast and not just in the delivery of projects for clients but also as society as a whole. And lastly, and we're going to speak about this in more detail in the case study, is sustainability. Um, so sustainability benefits of DFMA are huge, as summarised above um, with Sumner Street. The Forge is the UK's first net zero carbon commercial development, so that's a mouthful to get out. 25% um, in reduction to date in embodied carbon from the initial design stage, and 178 tonnes in steel have been saved by using our platform approach that Bryden would have, have created. And we'll speak about this in more detail in shortly. So you might think, this all sounds good, but why aren't more people doing it? What are the barriers in the construction industry? So there's lack of motivation with designers, contractors, comfortable with the status quo, supply chain immaturity, perceived risks, a lack of awareness of alternative approaches, and a tendency to post-apply solutions without focusing on value. It's often shoehorned into designs at the wrong stage rather than bringing it in early in the design where it can really bring value to a project. This is changing, and the tides are changing. We've got a presumption in favour of um, off-site 
mandated by the government now, and that's being pushed forward. So hopefully you'll start to hear a lot more about these. So over the next few slides, Nicola and Helen are going to speak about The Forge, a case study of PDFMA in practice. Good evening, all. So The Forge, it's um, located um, south of the Thames, um, not far from the, um, the Tate, and it's um, basically two offices for um, land securities. Here you can see where it's actually located um, in, um, in London, a very, very congested site. So um, Landsec came to us, we've been talking with them for quite a number of um, years now, and then they thought that they had a site that could maybe fit doing our platform's approach um, to an office building that they had. It had already been taken to stage three, we already had planning for it, so we were very much, um, as um, Emma's been saying, um, shoehorning something into something that maybe wasn't perfect for it. But Landsec had um, conviction that our um, approach, using the platforms, would actually suit this site and would give them the product that they required. Now, platforms is not something that um, we just dreamt up for this particular project. It's something that we've been working on for a number of years um, and we have used um, our partners within the Department of Justice and others and done uh, R&D on this to actually see if it actually practically works. It's um, fine to draw things and design them to um, high stages, but when you're taking things at a different approach, then it needs to be tested. So we were very fortunate that we had the, um, a site in the south that we could use, we could practice, we could um, build it, uh, just to make sure that it, it was a viable proposition. So when Landsat came to us, they'd actually been down to our facility. They knew that it wasn't something that was just pie in the sky, that was just drawings, that we'd just we just drew, dragged out every now and again to some prospective clients. It was something that we knew in a practical way that it could work. And um, it was you know, great that they had that um, faith in us. So, as I say, um, Landsec, they, um, we had a building that we had to, um, that we're already planning, so we had to make sure that, uh, you know, Landscot has got very, very high demands, so they've got inherent compliance w that we had to achieve, as they, wasn't gonna, they weren't going to sell this office space. Um, we had a, quite a, a particular structural grid for planning that we needed to achieve, floor-to-floor -floor heights um, and um, other limitations on the planning. So with our approach, the DFMA approach, it takes um, micro columns, um, flat slab construction, and it just approaches it in a different uh, way that you'll see um, later. Now, throughout the forge, it's not just um, an envelope and it's not just a structural frame. So it needs an awful lot of partners to actually engage with the process. So you know, we had live models, not only dealing with our uh, internal, the coordination between the architects, and MEP, structural and civil engineers, but also partnering with the facade um, manufacturers to make sure that everything that we had in the, in the building actually facilitated somebody else. There's no point putting a slab in and just forgetting about that you need to fix um, MEP to the soffit. So we did a simple thing. We added sockets that, so that we eliminated um, drilling on the site so that the modules could come in and we'd you know, plan this all out in the live model 3D and the client could see this all the way through to make sure that he was, uh, they were also fully engaged. As I say, that the platform approach, very much like the Billy bookcase, it comes in parts, parts that are assembled. So, as you can see, this, 
very much in, in line with the IKEA you know, assembly. You've got um, you know, certain um, elements with a beam and uh, columns that come together. You've got um, larger elements of those um, the cyan coloured beams that came, so that if all facilitating something else, but all constructed, so it made the um, installation on site as simple as possible. If you can see here, you know, we extended out to make a T-shaped column, so that when the installers were actually erecting it on site. It allowed them to get into the connections to actually just make it a little bit um, easier because we didn't have traditional um, steel erectors that did this. They were, they were construction professionals, but after some training, after you know, a, a couple of weeks, they were doing this because they knew exactly what the bolts that they had to use, they were supplied, they knew where they needed to be, and then there was the additional you know, checks that we carried on afterwards. So it, the very um, sort of you know, process that, like you say, with the Billy Book case, it's, it, 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 it works you know, just with good instructions and you can get this to uh, carry out. So I just want to show you this. This is actually some of the, um, the actual, how we tested the erection when we were doing the um, the actual um, R&D facility in the south. So we've got the beams going in, and this is the propping system that we used. So we, we redesigned the propping to make sure that not only could it be easily lifted into site and had specific connections for anybody to, to actually do it simply, but that it also facilitated elements of work to be carried out underneath. We also uh, experimented with um, you know, motorised um, levelling of the floor to get a, a really good um, finish to the screed. Um, and as you can see, that we've only got two operatives on the site. It's, you know, it's low um, intensity and everything is, we're using lifters, you know, no, nothing on um, you know, step ladders or things like that. So it's, you know, Designed for simplicity on site. The slabs were also looked at, as you, you can see, we saw on the uh, other um, slide with the shuttering system. So we went for a, um, an in situ um, cast slab, and you'd think with using DFMA that it's, you know, it's. Why, why don't you go for a precast solution? Surely bringing you know, something that's manufactured off-site um, off is, is far better. But we did the an analytics on this, and as you can see, to actually do precast, you've got an awful lot of operations for something that is really, really quite simple. We kept the grids to a very, very narrow um, centres so that we could get a one-way spanning slab to work. And that means that it, the reinforcement isn't complicated, and it wasn't. It's, um, it was many sheets of, of mesh that was used, and um, it, it, it gave a good finish, and we could actually do it with, as you see, those, those little yellow dots there. Those are the sockets that were cast in. So it's, you, sometimes when you think of DFMA, you think of, of precast and everything being manufactured off-site. Sometimes that is not the value. Sometimes it's a case of rethinking about it, going through the steps and actually designing something that actually fits the purpose, not what we actually think it needs. And as um, I touched on before, the MEP manufacturing, this um, was highly successful um, and an awful lot of this was manufactured off-site. And when we talk about MEP, it's the general, the time that it's not um, actually putting the elements into site. The time is a lot of it, um, the actual commissioning. So these elements were manufactured in a way, so I think we had five modules that made up, separate modules that made up that whole ceiling that you can see there. And you can see that there's quite a repeatable nature. Everything links in, um, and it was 
just uh, supported off the ceiling with um, the sockets, everything coordinated beforehand, and a lot of the modules were pre-commissioned and tested in the factory so that you only had final commissioning when you came to site. And the repeatable nature of it meant that you know, people um, that was actually doing these works on sites, they knew exactly where everything needed to be. They, weren't, you know, they, they didn't have to be looking at drawings all the time because they knew the process. So it was um, a really you know, a good uh, um, success. For all this, we've, we're now in the process of working with Cambridge University to all the data from this to um, establish sort of what the successes are, you know, um, on how actually quick um, these elements were. One of the final um, elements that's on any building is the facade, and this is what we, we mainly all see. So the you'd think that these two buildings got um, you know, varying um, elements to the facade stepped in. you think that it could be quite um, complicated in its elements. But here we broke them down to 10 actual individual components for the whole of the project. Now this was working with two companies. We actually went out to tender and these two companies were actually tendering against each other. But after some discussions, they worked out that actually one was really good at manufacturing and the other was really good at installation. And they worked together with us and you know, looking at how things were fixed, we changed the elements of the structural frame to actually enable these, um, these components to work. And you know, with looking at the program, the tight site, because we, we couldn't actually store an awful lot of um, equipment on the site. It was worked that we could get these 10 modules for the whole of the um, facade, and it was, it was going up really quick. Um, in fact, um, which was something quite um, impressive, it was seven and a half minutes per panel. Um, they were in, in, at one point we had to stop because they were <laughs> they were too quick. <laughs> so it's something that we will revisit when we we next do um, the next project. So as this, as we say, this this project was very much um, you know sustainability focused as well. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Helen now, and she's going to take you through some of the things that we learned and what we uh, focused on through the through the uh, period. Hello everyone. Um, so I think the whole thing about sustainability is that it's not just one part of the building we're looking at, it's everything, but actually enabling one uh, improvement through DFMA, so the idea of having a highly optimised superstructure, for example, has led to a whole raft of um, sustainability benefits. So just by um, optimising your superstructure, you suddenly make your building smaller, you've got a smaller building, it needs fewer materials, you have less transport to site, less embodied carbon, um, and you know there's a, ho a whole raft of improvements. Um, so these are some of the statistics that we've got so far. Um, obviously, we haven't quite finished construction yet, so these will hopefully change, and ideally for the better. Um, so, as things currently stand, we're at a 24% reduction in embodied carbon, and that is compared with the business as usual design. So, that was a traditional steel frame. Um, and it's really good having the two designs that are completely um, parallel because we're able to make these really, really clear comparisons. Um, we know that there's some further benefits that we're going to see over the next few weeks. Um, so, watch out for the uh, improved figures. Uh, we've got an 18.4% reduction in steel tonnage, a 13% reduction in concrete. And actually, that's huge. Like, if every project could do that, then just think about the benefits across the country and the world. Um, massive amount of construction productivity, which is being checked by Cambridge University, so we'll have really clear statistics on this project, how it actually performed. Um, and then that obviously has an impact on delivery time and cost. Um, some of the other things to mention is that all our concrete was procured within a 10 kilometre radius of the site, which is quite impressive considering we're in central London. Um, we've also managed to procure all British steel, 
um, which reduced our transportation compared to some of the European steel that we were anticipating we would have to procure. Um, and then our bricks and blocks have got a really high recycle content. Uh, and we've been able to use environmental product declarations for the facade and stud work, so we know exactly how that product was made and what the embodied carbon um, is within those particular products. And then importantly, we've got 99.9% um, of construction waste is being recycled. Um, so another chain reaction of benefit, we've said that we're going to reduce the volume, but we actually need to um, maintain the function at the same time. So if you've got a smaller building, that means that you need less ventilation, less lighting, fewer services. All of a sudden, you're reducing all your plant space down. If you're reducing your plant space, you've got an even smaller building again, and, y and you're using less energy and less embodied carbon, fewer materials. Um, but this isn't so the use of PDFMA hasn't prevented us from achieving pretty good certification as well. So it will be the UK's first net zero carbon commercial development and that's going to be certified by the UK GBC. Uh, we're on track to achieve gram excellence, so we've already got the design, design stage certificate and the construction stage is going really smoothly from that perspective. Um, the well standard, we started off trying to have a well-enabled building, but Landsec have noticed that there's a lot more demand in the office sector for a, a fully um, certified building. So we are on track to achieve well gold, and we potentially could get platinum, depending how a few things play out. Um, so it's quite interesting that you can design something that's made your building smaller and more efficient, but actually the people that are going to be working in this building have still got a really, really high level of well-being, um, and it, it will be a healthy building. Um, so some of those things in a little bit more detail. Um, we've done loads of work on thermal comfort, for example. Um, so a lot of dynamic simulation, looking at what happens throughout the year. So in winter, does an occupant have a different idea of comfort to in summer? How do people's level of clothing affect how they feel in the environment? If you sit near a facade where there could be a bit of a draft, does that have a different feeling of comfort to if you're sat more internal space within the office? Um, so it's really interesting, and actually by going into loads of detail, we've been able to influence what the servicing strategy is. We've looked at a lot of daylight modelling. It's a very confined site. Um, there's a lot of tall buildings around it. Daylight isn't the most amazing, but actually we're able to really optimise the facade to maximise what is available. Um, so some of those things about standardising facade, we're able to just tweak the height of the windows so that we've got that little bit of extra daylight. There's um, some fins on the building, so they're optimised to make sure that we're not providing too many shadows um, across the year. And it's a really flexible approach to climate change. Um, so it's very resilient. We looked at um, what the climate change would look like over the next, well, until 2050, so quite a long time, and made sure that our building was able to respond to those changes in climate, so potentially hotter summers, colder winters. Um, we've got a flexible facade, so because the panels are all and can be accessed and replaced really easily. If the climate were to change and we needed either different glazing solution or a different um, insulation, for example, those panels could be removed. It also means that if you've got internal spaces that were an occupied space and they turn them into a store, you could actually take out that glazed panel, provide it, um, replace it with an insulated panel, and suddenly you've got a better performing building. Um, and the idea that you can replace parts really easily reduces our whole life carbon. So replacing things or refurbishing them when they're needed rather than having to replace the whole facade in one go um, reduces the whole life carbon and also improves our operational carbon. Um, so we did loads and loads of energy breakdown work. So Neighbours is a, um, it's a performance standard that looks at operational energy rather than just regulated load. So it looks at how people are going to use the building in the future. So things like you turn on your lights, um, is it automated? Um, how much small power do you have? How many computers? What are your operating hours? And we've got a neighbours rating of 5.6 stars. 
um, which is what we're anticipating. That will then be looked at against meter readings in operation and the models tweaked. We can then work out whether the services are operating successfully or whether there's some issues, maybe the set point is wrong, stuff like that. Um, so we've got 50% reduction against the SIPC benchmark. And in terms of Part L reduction, this is 35%. It's based on the old regulations from 2013. Uh, and then all energy on site is decarbonised, so everything is electricity for heating, cooling, domestic hot water. Um, and then we've got power purchase agreements to make sure that all energy to the site is completely green. Um, and you can just see some of the impacts there that the PDFMA has had on our um, energy balance. Oh, wrong one. And then in terms of scenario modelling, we were able to look at all of these energy loads, which every single part of that graph is a different energy load, so quite a lot. Um, and compared to the base building, which is how Landsec see the building being designed and what we designed to, you can see that the smallest impact is actually what would happen in climate change. So we've made a really resilient building. The biggest impacts is actually all about how the building is occupied. So um, it's all about the small power use and things that we, as designers, we can't control. And all we can do is encourage future tenants to use the building in a responsible way and reduce those, the hours that they work, switch off um, small power when they're not using it, things like that. Uh, and then the building itself is really adaptable and flexible. So we know that changing patterns of working are going to come over the next few years. I mean, the pandemic taught us a lot about that. So um, the building is designed to be inherently flexible, so we can move internal walls. There's a lot of um, holes through beams to allow future services to be installed really easily without having to completely strip out a building and replace all the services. And then, again, I've already spoken about how the um, facade enables that flexible approach. And then we can't forget the end of life. Um, we need to be designing for the end of life at the start of a building. So really thinking about how the building can be easily disassembled and components can be used in the most valuable way. So instead of just taking a bit of you know, steel column and melting it down so that it can be used um, for another different type of steel column in the future, actually some of this um, can be demounted and used elsewhere. Um, a good example is that we're going to be taking raised floor system from another one of Landsex buildings and using that throughout. So we're actually using a circular economy principles within our design. Um, there's a lot of work around um, BIM and tacking of materials so that when someone does come to replace components in the future, they know what they're looking at. Um, I think a lot of the problems with existing buildings is that you walk in and you, you don't know what's there. You have to do a lot of surveys and this will hopefully limit that and make the building more valuable in the future. Over to you. So I'm going to take you on a quick whistle-stop tour of Crossrail now, just to give you an idea of that DFMA can be applied to a multitude of different projects and infrastructure projects like this. So another project where DFMA was applied is Crossrail. Brydenwood provided the design of the Elizabeth Line Crossrail Tunnel cladding. So the tunnels for this development were lined with sprayed concrete, which was a rough and uneven service. We were commissioned to design the fit out of the clanid of the interior of the person tunnels, not, not for the trains, for the people. Um, so crossrail tunnels needed cabling for power, lighting, fire systems, data and other services, which all had to be covered for security and for aesthetic purposes. Um, on the London Underground, traditional construction allows for a tolerance of plus or minus 20 millimetres. Now, at Bryden Woods, that is not good music to our ears, um, and we tend to work on much, much smaller um, tolerances. So, with that kind of tolerance, the assumption was that every fixing would require adjust adjustment. This means slow, labour-intensive and big uh, uh, very labour intensive and expensive processes with a big margin for error and um, so our solution was to apply a zero tolerance solution to these tunnels 
So the crossrail tunnels were long and narrow and there was hardly any room in them to manoeuvre heavy equipment, store materials or to lift and, and, and safely manoeuvre within them. Drilling and fixing into the concrete lining would have created health and safety issues and more people working at height. So our aim was to develop an engineering solution to minimise the fixings into the sprayed concrete and um, to support the structure for 23,000 cladding panels. So our solution followed the zero tolerance approach, as I mentioned, and it provided lighter panels, used fewer materials, spread up installation and improved health and safety. We used an entirely digital workflow and we eliminated the production um, of fabrication drawings and the potential for human error. So moulds were 3D printed or CNC milled um, from digital models and all reviewing of these was carried out um, and commenting was all carried out digitally as well. So that's how we made the workflow within the office. Um, the cladding panels are mostly curved in one plane. Some are curved in two. And we used a range of panel types. Some are solid and others were perforated to include an acoustic lining. They're cast from glass, reinforced, um, glass fibre reinforced concrete. And the panels are composed of tiny, high-strength fibres surrounded by a concrete matrix. The concrete protects the glass fibres and helps to carry the load. The result is a very durable material that can be cast to a very fine decorative finish, but it's nearly two-thirds lighter than a traditional concrete. So these lighter panels meant that we had lighter loads to support, fewer fixings and less load to carry. They required less material, cost less, emitted less carbon, um, in fabrication and they're also quicker to make because they were thinner and it set more quickly, the concrete set more quickly. Most importantly, the combined weight of the panels and the supporting structure met the construction requirements for a two-person lift and this is something we look at in a lot of our projects to try and eliminate uh, lifting gear where we can. A traditional lift can take is much quicker with, with manhandling than it is with doing it with a lifting device where you're adding time on. So by reducing the weight that allowed us to speed up the installation of the panels. So to fix the panels to the tunnel lining we used a stainless steel ladder framework that held the, uh, the cladding. The top brackets were fitted to the crown of the tunnel and a levelling brace was attached to the brackets to control rotation. The base brackets were installed to the platform. Ladder frames were then installed between the brace brackets and the levelling brace and the cladding panels could be fitted onto the ladder framework. The complex intersections between the two tunnels, this, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this area here, um, is the junction transitions and they were the most complex shapes. So our innovation was creating these double curved pieces which we called tusks. Um, casting the supporting structure out of the same material as the panels rather than the faceted steep structure. That took less space and again um, reduced the speed of installation. At the bottom of the cladding, the sec secondary frame sat on the platform, um, but the top was fixed into the concrete lining which was difficult because of its rough finish and inconsistent thickness. Manually drilling into the concrete um, particular height was dangerous um, and to overcome, overcome this um, the inaccuracy of the concrete spraying in, and we created a highly accurate positioning for the system for the panels. So the benefits of this project were that 23,000 panels were installed, 58% there was a 58% reduction in the weight of the cladding and the supporting structure, allowing for two-person assembly. There was a 96% reduction in the number of fixings needed. There was a 46% reduction in the total quantity of parts, and it was an entirely digital workflow, maximising standardisation and ensuring zero tolerance from, a design to, from design to manufacture to installation. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. If you've got any questions.
Hello. Um, you briefly touched on the subject of skills. And um, I'm sort of put in mind with the fact that in the 19th century, when um, sort of factory production came about and automation and, and machine making of, of things, there was a huge de-skilling of the population. Uh, so that as traditional crafts gave way to, to machine made and factory made goods, isn't the danger that this does the same to the building industry? I can start, you can yes. expand. Um, <laughs> I think we're always of the opinion that what we're doing isn't trying to take jobs away from people. It's not trying to, you know, give robots or automation people's jobs. I know it's a threat that architects always feel they're under, that, you know, things are being taken away from them as well. I think the, the process is trying to... We have, we have an ageing population. We have an inability in the construction industry to... Um, provide projects on time to, to cost. So rather than de-skilling the population, it's allowing for, yes, unskilled workers in, in some instances, but also construction industry professionals to ease their jobs and to also, it opens a wider range of, of, of uh, a wider range of skills up to more people, I think. So we're, we're widening the construction industry, and, and as we spoke about, demographics is a real issue in, in the construction industry at the moment. And so it's, I think it's less about de-skilling the population, it's more about opening it up to more people. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything to add? No? <laughs> While they're thinking, maybe I'll ask another question. <laughs> um, you, you've talked a lot about the benefits to construction, uh, and I wonder if maybe you could reflect a bit on what the design opportunities are, what the architectural opportunities are. Yeah, I think the architectural opportunities are huge, actually. I came from a background um, following my master's here at Westminster um, and did my studying for my part three at a very traditional practice. Um, it's a very different way of thinking. Joining Bridenwood was a shock to the system, I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. It's a, it's a very different way of, of, of thinking and approaching projects. But I think it's an approach to projects that all architects should bear in mind. It's a much more integrated approach to projects. And it's it's something that we can all learn for, from. I mean, we as architects, I think we think we need to reinvent the wheel every time we build a building, when actually there's much more sustainable, much more, um, much quicker, much more efficient ways of doing so if we learn lessons from what we've done before and we actually looked at standardising and we took that into account. Now, that's not saying, and this is something that we have with clients a lot of the time, that they're fearful of. I've, I've been working with a um, residential apartment provider who was very fearful that if we say, we standardised their process and, and provided their designers with a pattern book, that that meant that they had no flexibility in what their apartments and their apartment blocks looked like. That's not what it is at all. It's It's standardising, it's setting rules, it's, it's outlining key strategies and rules that allow for flexibility and allow for creativity within them, but ultimately bring you back to a really good grounding in that we can do this efficiently, efficiently sustainably and quicker if we stick to these rules. And actually it makes you more creative because you've got a set of constraints to work to. And I always think that actually... Uh, a site with no constraints is boring. If, if you get a site with lots of constraints, if you get a, a project with lots of constraints, it makes you more creative, it makes you think outside the box. And, and actually, that's what we at Bryden would do as a collective a lot of the time. And it, it means that... And actually, it's very beneficial from, for an architect's point of view to sit with a structural engineer and to sit with a, an analyst and... A, sustainability engineer and, and sit and think about things from a completely different point of view. Um, so, yeah, that would be my answer to that one. Thank you. I have a question, so I... Um... No, it's for the people that are online. 
Um, so I work in a practice where they focus on sustainability to an extent where we have, you know, a sustainability consultant that allows us to work with other practices to figure out the best solutions to come up for, especially residential. I was wondering if you have a platform that you share the knowledge that you've given us today to other professionals because there are quite a few things that I've seen overlap with other residential projects that we've done and other multidisciplinary, so I'm just wondering if there is a platform that you share, especially in the BIM side with coordination and material sampling and, um, you know, having a record of that. Um, I don't think there's any specific place where we collate information. Uh, we're not hiding anything. We just probably don't have that platform set up to share our knowledge with the industry. Um, we do quite a lot of work uh, with various universities, so I think about half of our team um, also do some tutoring at various different architectural practices, um, like architectural universities. Um, I do some um, particularly with Manchester University. So we are trying to like, educate students in particular, because if you can educate people whilst they're students and as soon as they go into practice they bring those knowledge and then they share the knowledge with um, people within practices um, and we all or quite a few of us do various speaking events um, through um, conferences on our website we've got podcasts and articles it's either thought pieces or something interesting that we share so I think the most recent one is about the circular economy principles and how we can incorporate that into design. Um, there's quite a few resources on the website, actually. Yeah, I think I think our website is the best yeah. place, really. We've got links to podcasts. We've got links to um, a lot of the talks we do. And I think Jamie, Jamie Johnson, who is our, one of our board directors, um, he recently received an MBE and it's for his services to the construction industry. And he is... His role is is very much going out and spreading the word about these things. So we do do a lot of speaking events and, and coming out to universities and things like this. But yeah, our website. I mean, go and have a look. There's a lot of a lot of knowledge we share on there. And I would say it's one thing that we we are very collaborative and of a pra as a practice. And um, we've done things like open source apps. So the Prism app we've got, which is. Um, building DFMA into a um, into an application where you can literally just, it's all open source, it's all online, you just Google Prism, draw a line and you can put certain mix of apartments in and it will build you a an apartment block suitable for DFMA principles to be applied to. So we do openly share this knowledge quite quite widely um, and we kind of strive to do that, I think. Yeah, definitely. I'd, I'd say that, um, yeah, as, as a company, we, um, as I say, we do industry talks with um, some of the board members have actually just um, done a book, Design to Value, that's just recently been published. So it's very much the ethos of the company that, you know, we, you know, we share our information um, as we said, we, for the forge, we're, we're working closely with all the analytics um, on that project, and those will be published and issued out to the industry. We, we don't like to hide anything. We think it's for sharing. It, it's the only way that we're going to, you know, achieve good things in the industry if we do share this. So, yeah. Thank you. I think that's. Um a lot of the things that you've mentioned is collaborating with younger people as students and um, and that's great because it offers young people an opportunity to look at further developing their career in a in the best way possible. I think I, I can't get the name in my head because there is a platform that allows practices to combine that knowledge together into one um, server. I just can't think of the name but I think it's really great to perhaps look into that because it allows other practices to share the knowledge in real time and how things that didn't work and things that worked. And I think combining that into one uh, resource would be such key um, learning um, opportunity for professionals as well as students. 
when, when I think of the name, I'll let you know. I just can't think of it right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, but one thing that we do do is that we're in part of the Construction Innovation Hub. So we are involved in industry, you know, that, that's available to all industry. So, um, yeah, it's, so we've, we've maybe um, do, do something similar, but just in a different way so, so that we can, um, because what we like to do is make sure that we've got a, a, raw, a broader reach um, because it, sometimes it's it's great going down channeling one sort of um, it's, uh, industry, but if we can get like a broader reach, it then brings in more in, um, ideas. So things like the construction innovation hub is one way that we've been, you know, very very active in just just to like you say disseminating all this good information. Thank you very much. Hello. Um, I really enjoyed your uh, analogy, the IKEA analogy for um, uh, construction on uh, MMC, the fact that you're not going to want to drag your uh, bookcase up your stairs to your bedroom. It makes a lot of sense. Um, just to play devil's advocate, because um, my previous company, um, their kind of solution for MMC is volumetric. Um, and the kind of uh, the advantages, I'm sure you're aware, is kind of, you know, quality control, quality assurance, controlled environment in a, um, in a, in a lab beforehand, and uh, plug and play and qu um, very quick construction. And I'd just like to hear your guys' opinion, because obviously you've gone down a different route, it seems to be, from what you said, but I'd like to hear your opinion on what um, you think of volumetric. Yeah, definitely. Volumetric, in, in the right context, it, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, a, a previous company, I did lots of volumetric for student accommodation. Works perfectly. When you've got a rigid grid set out, volumetric, it, 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 nothing really can beat it. The, the downside that we find with volumetric is when you get to tight sites, sites where you've got restrictions on deliveries, you've got site restrictions so you can't store anything, you, you, you start to get more problems. So that's why, you know, with volumetric, we, you know, we've, we've never said no to volumetric. It's just that we thought, right, there's lots of people doing some great stuff with volumetric. So we just wanted to look at a different route for different solutions. So I think it's a bit like horses for courses. So definitely in, in some scenarios, it's the perfect um, element. But then others, you know, the platform solutions, it allows things to be taken to, you know, different, um, different sites with different configurations. So it's, uh, we always say, it's, it's you design to value. So that might mean, we made it, the forge, for, ex for example, we actually, when we first got the forge, we said, we don't want to do it platforms. And then sector was said to us, why? It's perfect. And we went, and we came up with all these reasons why it shouldn't be. But they pushed us and they challenged us further than that we were maybe prepared to go at that time to actually, um, you know. So it's very much, you've got to be open-minded to it. So the, again, another project, you might say, well, I'll do, you know, a, a very traditional concrete frame flat slab, because that suits that situation. So I think you know it, it's all about being open to all these ideas. We're getting you know very um, aware of all the different sort of processes that um, available to us, and and why not you know try a mix match? But um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a key thing as well. The the, mm. the mix match is is a key thing. You don't have to go down one route. It doesn't mean that you can't also mix solutions. We've had clients that aren't quite ready to go you know they don't want to go down volumetric modular fully they don't want to go down a dfma solution and you're kind of trying to start to bring dfma principles and off-site principles to them and um, and we've had clients who do who want to do build the structure completely completely traditionally and they want to start bringing in modular bathroom pods because that works for them particularly with things like hotel providers, that works. Maybe um, affordable housing providers, that works for them. And it's about, it's like Nicola says, it's about analysing the client, what they're ready for, what they have the capacity to, to take on, the maturity of their supply chain. Um, some of the supply chains just aren't ready for somebody to go in with a full kit of parts and them to be able to provide it successfully. It takes time. Um, 
so it is, yeah, it's very much about analysing the clients. And, and, and we've definitely, I mean, LNG Modular Homes, which is part of my experience, was fully modular. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, yeah, fully volumetric modular. So we've done all sorts, and it's, we're definitely nothing off limits. Thank you very much. So could I just ask a quick, a quick question? Um, you, you talked about, this in this project, you're going straight from the model to fabrication, so no drawings really, right? So. <laughs> Plenty of drawings. <laughs> the, um, although that you know, the, the model was used for the fabrication, um, industry is still not quite prepared for no drawings. You've, you will still have clients that still like to see a drawing. So you, you still pro, you know, provide them. It's, it's, quite, <laughs> it, it's quite, you know, the, it, it's just something that uh, I think that we'll be doing for still quite a long time yet. But, you know, the industry, we're mainly in manufacturing of components on, you know, even the tier one contractors. A, a, a less and less about the drawings and more and more about the modules, yeah. but yeah, um, you, so, we so still. The, so the fact, so the drawings are for sort of a, a, like a legacy issue or something like they're just yeah, for people who like to have a look at a bit of paper or something. Yeah, I must admit we're printing less drawings, which is good, excellent yeah. for the environment. And the, but uh, yeah, we still we still have to do uh, drawings. That you know, it is still still a deliverable. Um, our scopes, you know always have a, a physical drawing deliverable. Still got to do a door schedule. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, look, thanks so much. I just, just one other quick question. Do you work with the Warwick Man Manufacturing Group at all? Have you ever done anything with them? I, I haven't. Okay, fine. All right. Well, I've, no, yeah. no, no, they're, no. They're interesting. But yeah, okay. But look, thanks so much. It was a wonderful talk, really. Super interesting. So thank you. <laughs>